next speaker is Dr. Andre Kuo, who is a senior lecturer and the director of the graduate coursework studies under the School of Business. He studies decision-making behavior and strategy with a focus on emerging technologies in business. His research seeks to raise awareness of how emerging technologies can contribute to socially and economically thriving communities and how they can influence behavior and decision making toward technologies. Today, the topic of his presentation is Deepfake, Synthetic Manipulation of Reality. Let's give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for introducing me. I'd like to thank Dr. Naziru and the organizers for inviting me here today to share about the topic on Deepfake. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> it's late afternoon, I understand. Now, what is deepfake? Before I go through the slides, I'd like to invite you uh, to participate with me in visualization. Do you have your handphone with you? Do you have a QR code scanner? Okay, please get them ready because I'm going to share a lot of um, sources of information that I'm not able to contain within these slides, but it's going to be expand your knowledge into several areas where you can uh, uh, look for more information. What is deepfake? I'm glad my previous speakers, uh, my colleagues, have um, actually done the heavy lifting of explaining a lot of concepts about the importance of data, what is AI, what is deep, um, what is deep learning, and what is um, machine learning. Yeah? So the word, the term deep fake is actually a portmanteau of deep learning and fake media. So it's combined together, right? Using deep learning, a subset of AI, it can merge, it can combine, it can replace, superimpose all forms of uh, media, whether it's in textual form, is uh, video or audio, and you can create a fake or synthetic media that you can't even differentiate between the real one or the fake one. What's important here is that it has visceral appeal. So that makes it very attractive. I'm employees. Let me share a video with you. This is uh, publicly available on YouTube. Um, I believe many of you have come across this uh, video before about how they create um, the video of a uh, fake uh, President Obama is actually done by the University of Washington. So let me play this video and share with you. I'm employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City and foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicare. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees hope together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use... Uh I won't play the whole uh, video because it will be very time consuming, but at least we are now on the same page of what deepfake is all about. Now, before I go through and explain a lot more about deepfake, we have to understand why deepfake, the history behind this whole thing. It is about the history of photography. I'm employees. Anyone interested in photography? Anyone is a photographer here? Right. This is the very first photograph in 1826, almost 200 years ago, by Joseph. He's a French. A few years later, in 1839, is Louis Jack Daguerre. He's the, he created the first permanent photograph. Very popular, very famous, because he's the first one. And he got all the accolades and recognition for being the inventor. Of course, at the same time, uh, we have Henry Fox Talbot. He created a different form, but it is the one that is used today, the positive and negative film. Now, with all the accolades, with all the recognition, is everyone happy? Actually, someone is not happy. It's a fellow inventor. 
and this became the first fake photo and fake news that is known. He's also an inventor of uh, photography, yeah. But the fact is that um, he came later because uh, he came up with this self-portrait as a drowned man in 1840. This is by Bayard. Um, I'm just, I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but I will just highlight a few areas. For example, the corpse which you see here is that of Monsieur Bayard, inventor of the process that has just been shown to you, all the wonderful results of which you will soon see. He's still alive, right? So another one is, he's not happy with the fact that the government which has supported Monsieur Daguio, more than is necessary, declared itself unable to do anything for Bayer, Monsieur Bayer, and the unhappy man threw himself into the water in despair. So he's not happy, so he created this photo to attract attention. To tell everyone, he's equally a good inventor. He has put in a lot of effort. So this is the first known fake photo that comes together with fake news. Now, what do you think of publicity of fake news? Is it all negative? Do you remember this photo? Or have you seen this photo before? Nessie, right? Taken in 1934. And a lot of people believe in it, isn't it? Right? Um, but what does Loch Ness Monster have to do with um, creating fake uh, publicity? Did it lead to anything good? Yes, you're right. <laughs> Tourism. In fact, it brought the, um, the attraction of uh, Loch Ness uh, to popularity. And you can see that this is how the official website of the Inverness, uh, Inverness and Loch Ness Tourism Destination promoted as the possibility of monster sighting. But well, we know that's done after so many years, isn't it? Yeah. So image manipulation has always occurred throughout history. We have a few notable examples. For example, the composition of uh, the 18 US president using three different photos to combine into one. This is to bring up, um, to show that, um, uh, to portray himself in a much greater light. It can also be used in a different way. If you don't like someone, you can erase the person from the photograph. As you can see from the example here, this person is missing. And if you have your handphone ready, let me show you that um, in today we have Photoshop. And we know that um, a lot of you have used Photoshop before. You do a little bit touch up, but this should go to show that um, Photoshop has been used to manipulate image, um, to create or to enhance image as well. If you have taken photograph, you, um, do you want to touch up yourself to make yourself, um, to remove some blemish? Is it common? Yeah. So, but it doesn't work all the time because there can still be errors, right? Because this is still the old way. But today Photoshop has started to incorporate AI to improve um, the, the reality, uh, the realism of the photos. So we know that in movies, there's integration of artificial intelligence in the visual effects and also computer generated interface. So for example, the latest movies we have, Indiana Jones, um, they DH uh, the actor Harrison Ford. They also use, for example, you have watched Marvel, Captain America. They can actually do a body transformation. And um, if you watch Avatar, so they also, make um, the actor, Sam Waddington, in a, as a role uh, in, a, in a show, Jake Sully. He turns out to be a parapolet badging, but in reality, as the, act, the real actor, he's, he's uh, able-bodied, yeah? And posthumous reprisal of uh, Brian O'Connor in Fast and Furious 7, you can see that um, they can bring up um, uh, deceased actors to reprise their roles, okay? So I won't explain any more about what artificial intelligence is, machine learning and deep learning, because this is all a subset to, of it. Um, now, when I put up this slide, I was thinking, uh, what should be the best title? Because if I say how to create deep fake, it sounds dangerous, right? Because it's as if I'm teaching you how to create, um, to make deep fake, uh, fake images. But what I want to show you is that, um, what is the mechanism behind uh, the creation of deepfake? There are two ways, encode, autoencoder and decoder. Basically, you're mapping two uh, sets of target images, let's say A and B. Then you allow the, the, um, 
the AI to learn what's the similar between both of the pictures, and then you insert the first feature into the second feature. Yeah? Or another way is the generative artificial uh, neural network, whereas you train two competing uh, models based on the neural networks, and they learn from each other. One is to generate uh, the pictures, and one is to try to discriminate to tell whether it's real or fake. And over time, as they learn from each other, you can't see the distinction between the real and the fake anymore. So it means that they are able to generate a fake photo that is as clear or as rese that resembles a real one that you can't really differentiate. So we are actually living in a times now where it becomes um, more and more difficult to discern what is fake compared to what is real. Yeah? Not just images or media, but also news in terms of information. Let's move to the next one. Now, there are um, a lot of um, positive um, users when it comes to this kind of technology. For example, you can use, you can change uh, a horse to a zebra. It still looks the same using an existing photograph. Or you can change night to day. So it's not just um, human images, but you can use all kinds of images. Or it, Companies have used it to improve user experience and to enhance marketing. For example, if you go to US, the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg in Florida, you can actually visit this museum, whereas they uh, resurrect um, the renowned artist Salvador Dali. So in the image, you have um, Dali, seems to come back to life, you can take photos with you, I can interact with all the visitors and also uh, this is used to enhance the visit experience. People like it actually, the visitors. They find a lot of joy and fun interacting with uh, a deep fake, uh, Salvador Dali. Another one is uh, Volkswagen's uh, 70th anniversary advertisement in Brazil, whereby they actually tap on nostalgia, right? A deceased uh, Grammy winning singer, this is uh, Alice Regina, uh, she died in 1982. But um, it's significant to the Brazilians because it's actually uh, helping them to recall a certain era, right? And actually, there are people who move to tears watching this kind of uh, advertisement. So it's been very uh, eff uh, effective. Now, in China, there are also cases whereas um, live streamers, you can't be doing live streaming 24 hours as a human being, right? Because you need time to do other things, like you have to go to bed, you have to uh, eat and so on. Or you have other activities that uh, you need to spend time on. But you can create deep fake images or videos of yourself, and these deep fake images or videos can help you to continue <laughs> live streaming, and your viewers can't tell the difference. So in other words, you can continue selling your products. But then again, um, we know that defect has been, that has been used for nefarious uh, reasons, malintention. And they are, that's because of bad actors. So it has impact on democracy because you can see some of these news headlines. For example, defecting it. When it comes to election, you can see that a lot of um, avenues use um, fabricated videos which try to cast politicians either in a more positive or in a negative light, or spread wrong information, disinformation, or malinformation about certain uh, endorsements or rents, right, that creates um, disruption. Or even the doctor, um, Rishi Sunak, the PM of um, UK. So this disrupts actually public opinion. Another one is, this is an actual case that happened in 2019, Frosters, in fact, use audio defects. It's not images only, audios. And actually, the company lost almost 200,000, uh, euros. Uh, this is a very recent case in May 2023. You can see that the uh, fake AI images has been used to create explosion in Pentagon. And actually, it disrupted uh, the financial market. So there's a dip of 0.29% over 10 minutes until the Pentagon actually clarified there's no such thing. So you can see that deepfake has actually a significant impact on democracy and also um, people and also our understanding of the current world. So the underlying issue is that individuals tend to believe what has been shared 
in the absence of warnings or captions, you can't tell the difference. I think one of our colleagues has shared before whether with uh, captions or without captions has significant impact on the emotions, right? So we tend to share um, images when we think they are accurate, right? Because we try to be helpful, isn't it? Okay. So this is what happened uh, when researchers found uh, in their studies. Another one is that um, we know that um, it has been confirmed deep fakes actually contribute to online disinformation. The problem is that when you view such kind of um, fake images or fake videos, you can't tell whether they are real or fake. The problem is that when you can't tell, you feel uncertain. And your uncertainty leads to erosion of trust in the media because you no longer are able to trust the source of information where it comes from, especially a lot of news is now available on social media. And when it comes to detection, here's another study, a very big study um, published in H uh, PNAS. Uh, these researchers actually asked 15,000 over participants to try to detect which is authentic and which is fake. And they found that you only need a combination of human eye and also AI to be able to detect accurately. If you use AI only, it is not perfect. If you rely on human eye, it is also not perfect. You can't really detect accurately. So it means that it is very difficult to discern authenticity in visual media. And if you refer to Europol, these are some of the examples of uh, criminal activities. It can be harassing or humiliating individuals online. It can also be perpetrating extortion or fraud, as we have mentioned uh, in the uh, mimicry of audio case earlier, or facilitating document fraud, falsifying or manipulating electronic evidence for criminal justice investigations, disrupting financial markets, as I mentioned in the example earlier, or distributing disinformation and manipulating public opinion, and finally, stoking social unrest and political polarization. Uh, these are not um, exhaustive. If you go to the website, you can see a lot more issues, um, criminal activities related to defect. So how can we improve governance and authentication mechanisms? This morning, uh, Dr. Shisha mentioned that there's always a lag between uh, government policies and regulation compared to when it comes to trying to regulate issues like this, isn't it? Um, what we can see is that perhaps we will need to eventually invest in detection techniques, something like an antivirus. When, we've, when the first computer is created and subsequently the software and everything that comes together, we find that people have nefarious reasons to create virus. And now, perhaps one day, we will need detection filter. Social response, we need to fact check or counter disinformation. But again, if you rely on websites to help you to do a fact check, it is not sufficient because it's not all encompassing. There's a lot of fake news, fake media that circulates around in the internet. So it, it boils down to individuals to check your information to make sure it's correct. Regulation, of course, we need to pursue the beneficial users, but we also need to curtail the malicious ones. Uh, but if you over-regulate, you can also stifle creativity and progress because technology, as we know, is a tool. It depends on in whose hands it is used and in, for what purpose it is used for. So also important is to ensure individual and communal values are safeguarded. So it's not just about regulating technology, we also need to protect, uh, provide the rights, to enhance the rights of individuals and community. Or reframe the narrative or discourse or defects because now we are reading a lot about the negative impact of defects and how defects have been used for nefarious reasons but we haven't really heard about the benefits of this technology. So what is important is this. Perhaps we can take a different perspective. We call it the social construction of technology perspective. So what it means is that so the society as a whole, where there are stakeholders, when you find that there are benefits of this technology, you use it, 
you become a stakeholder, definitely you want to shape its development towards something beneficial, something good for the users. So when stakeholders find that they are beneficial users, they will develop it in a positive direction. And they become responsible for the technology development. Ultimately, these stakeholders, as a society, they self-regulate the technology, the direction of technology, and also they will start to establish code of ethics. Because to ensure that all the stakeholders are well protected and they can shape the technology socially in the manner that they wish it to be in a positive light for the greater benefit of the society. So here are uh, two further reading. Um, you can read more about social construction of technology perspective on the left. And on the right, um, this is actually a report uh, that is sent to the Dutch parliament for the policy uh, response. And together, there's a number of uh, researchers that has been interviewed to give their perspectives. So um, I was also uh, one of those who contributed to the perspective. So thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? If anyone have any questions, feel free to raise up your hand. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, when you were bringing up potential solutions to address the proliferation of AI deepfakes, um, I was wondering, uh, would education help to curb the issue as well? And considering how quickly the technology is progressing, would any education even last that long with the tips that we teach uh, maybe the older generation to use, like for example, checking for like audio hitches or looking for like mild distortions in the face shape? Would since technology is progressing so quickly, would any education or advice that you can provide to the older generation hold up at all? Would it even be practical to show them how we can actually detect deepfakes at their current stage? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think what you suggest is very important, education. Education is not just about detecting the defect technology. Education is about being able to be digitally literate, especially for the younger generation, uh, the young children, and also the older generation who are not tech savvy. Yeah? So what is important is that they are aware of the kind of fake news or fake um, media that's circulating around the social media or in the internet, that they will be able to fact check for themselves and they will behold um, circulating this, uh, you know, it's, it's reflexive, right, isn't it? When you receive something, wow, something has happened. <laughs> It uh, is very visceral and you feel that you want to warn your relatives or your friends. Um, but it's important with education, with the right kind of education, with the enough um, information that you behold, but check the information before you circulate it. So that is important because it boils down to individual understanding of what's happening in the current world. Yeah, And um, in our second question, you mentioned about... Um, uh, sorry, I, I want you to, if you don't mind to repeat the second question. Yes, it's, it's true. Um, I would say that um, if you look at all the sources of um, or possibility of authentication, uh, I would say in the one or two years ago, there's still possibility of detecting deepfake. You can see, that because deepfake um, has become accessible, this kind of technology, you know, manipulation of images has been available a long time ago. Uh, it's been used extensively in the media, um, in the movies, right? Big companies. But, over, but as technology advances, it becomes um, less costly and it becomes more accessible. So the early stages of deepfake, you can see glitches. You can tell that it's actually deepfake. But as the technology advances, authentication becomes more and more difficult. And for people, those, the stakeholders and developers of authentication um, technology, they also have to work harder <laughs> to try to detect. But eventually we find that it's a battle between um, 
fake images advancement and also authentication advancement. But it seems, yes, you're right, education is important because at the end of the day, we all might have to continue to upgrade our education as well with the contemporary issues so that we are well aware how to safeguard ourselves. Thank you very much. I just want to ask a quick question because um, in one of the slides you mentioned about shifting the narrative about deep fakes from a negative perception to something more positive. So I wanted to ask like what could be the positive implications of deep fakes? And the second question I want to ask is you mentioned that um, regulations shouldn't be too string stringent because that could hinder innovation. But from my perspective, I think regulation is really important because of all the harms. Yes. So yeah, what, um, what balance um, do you have to combat that? Yeah, yeah right. We are facing a tug of war, actually. Um, if you focus a lot of the, um, when the narrative is very negative, and you highlight all uh, the issues of how defect has been used, uh, to create harm on just not just individuals, the society, and a lot of stakeholders. Um, what it means is that you are actually inviting a lot of um, uh, bad actors to see the potential of this technology to be used for further harm, right? But we reframe also. We also want to highlight the positive users because the technology is already here. But by telling people, hey, their benefits and their companies, for example. Um, Dali Museum and also Volkswagen, they have used it for marketing purpose. These are acceptable, isn't it, by the viewers, knowing that all in the movies, right? So a lot of uh, stakeholders, developers, those who have interest in this technology will come in and build this technology together. And we have more people looking at the potential, at the positive side of the technology. Over time, they will outweigh and overcome the negative aspect. There will be more good people looking at the good side of the technology compared to those who want to use it for malicious purposes. Yeah. So what, what we are trying to see, this is based on the social construction of technology perspective, is so that the whole society can come together. So we don't just rely on government to regulate the technology. But if you over-regulate the technology, what happens is that it can go underground. What happens is also that we do not have good developers who are willing to take it further for positive users. So we have also curtailed innovation to a certain extent, the positive side. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Any more questions, anyone? Yes, one more. Hello, um, I actually have a question that's related to the uh, one on positive impacts for the fake. Uh, um, so my field of uh, research is in human trafficking and I've noticed that with um, software like Clearview AI, they've started to track um, child predators using AI. So my question is whether deepfake can be used for social movements as well. In the example that instead of it being seen just as like cyber criminals and deep, like in terms of like deepfake pornography, whether these things can be used to actually capture child predators and traffickers instead. Or if there's any research in terms of like deepfake and if there's like law enforcement that's actually using it as a positive tool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. At the moment, we tend to see a lot of negative aspects when it comes to deepfake. Uh, but if you go back further, the underlying technology is actually generative adversarial networks and also AI that is being used to generate images like this. They're being used for medical imaging in healthcare. They're being used in various areas, not just uh, movies, but also in the uh, marketing side. Uh, yeah. So definitely, um, we also want to invite more and more developers and uh, stakeholders to come and explore this technology to, so that it can be taken in a positive direction. Uh, right now, we see that it's been co-opted for nefarious and malicious use. Yeah? So we have to find more people, good people come together as a society as a whole to move it in a more positive direction. Yeah? Thank you.